Rob Williams is the national sports editor of the Daily Hive and its offside sports vertical. Rob, the hockey guy on X, and he joins us here. After a busy day at practice, how are you? Busy week, really, of mm. things to talk about. Lots. Rob file. Yes. Yeah. Drama. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you make of the drama? Is it drama in your mind? Unexpected, right? Like, they've won three in a row, points in five of six, back above the playoff bar. I was already looking at the standings uh, six games into the season. Uh, this is not usually the time where you get you know, little brouhaha at practice. Um, but there it was. Apparently, you know, it's. it sounds like it was pretty pretty quick and, and uh, decisive between Miller and Pedersen, taking, you know, exchanging some wax at each other. Um, you know, of course, this has happened many times before in the past, right? Like you, in terms of players having, you know, going at each other in practice, what do teams say? They always say the same thing. Oh, it's nothing. You know, it's like we're family. We're just, you know, having a, having a little argument. They always say it's, it's, there's, there's nothing to it. Nothing to worry about. Usually I think that's probably correct. Sometimes not. Sometimes there's, you know, two players go at each other because of other things bubbling to the surface. Right. So what is it in this case? I don't profess to know, but we do know that there's a bit of a history there, right? There's, there's has been some friction between these two players in the past um, that you, you know, we've kind of heard to heard to the grapevine over the years. Um, so yeah, I don't know what, what do you guys make of it? Well, he, oh, look at that. He threw it back. On yeah. Us. Isn't it? Um, <laughs> he, you know, it, uh, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. Uh, and, and, you know, we were talking about Garland and Joshua had a skirmish of practice once. Can you imagine given their chemistry on the ice uh, you know, thinking that that would happen again. Um, generally, these things are are pretty good. It, it comes the timing's a little odd in this, in that Pedersen is tracking better right now. Um, so I don't know how those how that intersects with the timing of of a skirmish like this. If he was still really struggling, just like completely invisible, um, it would almost be more understandable than the fact that he it is coming along. It, maybe not at the pace that that JT Miller or some fans would like, but it is coming, isn't it? I think so. I mean, the pressure has ramped up for Pedersen. There's no doubt about that. Now coming home, I mean, the, the fact that they've been winning games, I think cools things quite a bit, but the fact that you're now back home, you've got to face the questions from the media. Uh, you know, you'll hear the murmurs in the crowd, uh, you know, if Pedersen struggles. So I think that those are issues that are going to be that are going to be factors uh, up ahead here. Now, no goals, three assists in in six games. He does have points in back to back games, and he has been playing better of late. I think he has since he was moved on to the line with Connor Garland and Nils Hoaglander. I do think that we've seen a lot better from Pedersen. I think a lot of credit has to go to to Garland in that. And, you know, sure, you, you'd you like your high-priced player to be driving Garland and not the other way around. But in the short term, I think who cares how it, how it works? I think you get players working together and, and finding chemistry like they seem to be. I think that's a good, uh, good sign for Pedersen moving forward. Okay. Um, well, speaking of Garland... He's upped his lot in life, and uh, you think he's now a, fi- a top six fixture, huh? I think so. I think you know. I mean, we're going to see when when Dakota Joshua returns to the lineup. You know, perhaps Joshua reunites with Garland, but I don't think they reunite on the third line. Like they reunite reunite on the second line if they do at all. If you know, you have the option of keeping Hoaglander there. How do you put Garland? You know, no offense to Teddy Bluger, or Pew Suter, or others. How do you take Garland away from one of your top two centers right now? I don't see how you place him on a line that doesn't include JT Miller or Elias Pettersson. Uh, you know, you look at what he's done in the last two, you know, last season with in a third line role was 47 points, 20 goals. You know, those are good numbers. And he did that with Teddy Bluger as a center and just fighting for scraps on the on the second power play unit. He's now on the power on PP one. 
you, you've got him on, on with Pedersen. And as we just mentioned, like he's driving, he's driving play. So to me, like is Connor Garland one of your, like, is he your, he's maybe not, I think your best winger is Besser. Is he your second best winger? I mean, sure, he's sure playing like it right now. I mean, if not their best winger. Uh, so I don't see a reason to, to place Garland on the third line. I think the, the, the theory before was that he, he wants the puck so much that you kind of, you can have him drive a, a, another line on his own. But to me, I think you've got to load up. Like you're looking, you know, what were they looking for all, all summer? They're looking for a, a piece to play with Pedersen and, and uh, so they could have a second line that, that uh, you know, really clicked. Why not Garland? Yeah, uh, and I mean, uh, Taka was outlining yesterday uh, what it takes to play with Garland. Do you like uh, Elias in that group then, Rob? The chemistry, Elias and Garland? Absolutely. I mean, look at the look at the plays they're making. Like Garland, uh, we've seen it a couple times. The first time they, they connected for a goal where Garland finds Pedersen in the slot and then he feeds Hoaglander for a tap-in. Uh, that was in Philadelphia. The same thing nearly happened again in, in Chicago. I think we've seen a, a lot of, uh, you know, great plays between those two players. And one thing, I mean, one thing I want Pedersen to be doing more of, you look at what he's done through six games, he's got nine shots on goal, like one and a half shots per game for Pedersen. Like that's not enough, right? Like, this is a guy that, you know, remember his first NHL goal? coming down the wing he's got a two-on-one takes the shot for himself right that was a player that didn't think about passing in that moment he had that instinct to score um yeah he's a great playmaker but i'd like to see him you know be a little more be a little more hungry to to score goals himself and if you've got garland a, a, another good playmaker on that line feeding him uh you know, why not? I mean, if he's going to be able to feed uh, Hoaglander for Tappins, yeah, do that all day. But I think there, there's going to be a lot more opportunities playing with Garland where it's not necessarily going to be Patterson, you know, feeding his wingers. He's, he's going to get a little bit of that back um, in the form of, of uh, passes from, from Garland. So I, I think that's a, a massive, uh, you know, it could be a, a really great thing for Patterson to get him out of his slump, A, and then just to, like, have someone solidify that, that, can be his running mate on the second line. I thought it was also great, you know, talk at speaking about Garland and how he's changed as a player. And he was really speaking about how much Garland has improved defensively and talking about wanting to get Garland on the penalty kill even um, going forward. So, you know, if you've got the trust to talk it, if you've got a guy that can be defensively responsible uh, on your line, you know, as opposed to Daniel Sprong say, you know, that's going to be you know, a, a player that's going to be, that's going to be something that talk will have trust in your line and you'll be out there for more minutes. I think that's a good thing for, for both of those players. All right. Now let's get into the Rob Williams file, like the deep <laughs> file. Uh, and, and you have been on this from the get go and you've been adamant. Francesco Aquilini likes blue and green as much as they are willing, finally willing to accept the skate as part of its history and as part of its portfolio, blue and green ain't going anywhere. Except now we have more evidence. 46% of the remaining home games have been earmarked for skate jerseys. New elements around the arena adorned in black, red, and yellow. Yes, the plaza is freshly painted blue and green, but most of everything else has gone black or yellow, including the damn seats in the place. <laughs> Rob Williams, are you willing to flip flop on your position? Yes, that it will be blue and green going forward. Good question, Price. No, I do think it's going to be blue and green going forward. I still don't believe that Aquilini likes the. I think he prefers blue and green. I think he likes. I think he likes money. I mean, and and the, the, the black skate jersey definitely makes money. Are they willing to go to it full time though? I think this is sort of the halfway point where they kind of go, okay, we're going to wear. You know we're going to wear this jersey for for a lot of these games. They wore the jersey a lot last season as well. Um, so like no, grew, I, right? I they just, just kept on. They just kept on adding more to games. Yeah. <laughs> no, I I think it's definitely interesting. And now you know, seeing the uh, like a new banner showing the 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 skate logo up in up at Rogers Arena is interesting because it has been blue and green all over the arena. 
No, I'm still saying I think the black seats are going to be black either because they got a good deal on it at the at, from the seat manu the famous seat manufacturer that uh, <laughs> that they were speaking with, or I think more likely the black seats blend in, right? If you go bright blue with your seats and you are got a few empty seats, that stands out a little bit more on television. I think black is just a little bit more seamless. I think that's why they did that. Uh, because if you wanted to make a splash, guys, they could, they could make a splash. Like they could come in and say, bang, the seats are, are black and we're switching our jerseys and do all the rest. I don't think they're doing like a slow rollout of the jersey. They know it works. They know the fans love it. I just don't see a full-time switch in the future. You know, Rob is so close to the story, Blake, it's possible that he can't see the forest through the trees. It, it could be, yes, yeah. He, he seems to be missing all sorts of signals here. Like, I would feel terrible for Rob Williams if mm -hmm. he wound up getting this wrong, given the time, energy, <laughs> efforts that he has put into this over the years. Rob, um, but let me ask you this. Uh, I, I think we know anecdotally that the uh, skate and that color scheme is a preference of Canucks fans. Could you see a world where that becomes the home jersey, like either all 41 times or with the odd exception for retros and what have you, and they use blue and green on the road? And that's just the regular course of action for them. Skate at home, blue and green on the road. So weird. So uh, it would weird. be so yeah. weird. Unprecedented. But, unprecedented, but maybe that's a good thing, right? I, I don't look. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like I have a visceral reaction to that immediately. I'm like, I don't like the <laughs> the, the, the. I know it's the, so weird. Yeah, I need more. We need more order in our life, guys, than than to have like completely different jerseys at home and and on the road, and also the white skate arguably could look better than the black skate. I, I'm I'm a big fan of the white skate jersey. So if you're gonna yeah. if you're gonna switch, you go all the way and switch. Um, but there's no rules here. Like there's nothing that requires them to do that, right? Like they can just tell the NHL this is what we're wearing at home. This is what we're wearing on the road. You it could but I think just why why do it? Well why do it right just it's because brand, then you, like you the, serve you both like masks the it's brain confusion though. I, no, yeah. I, I understand there would be a million branding people who would tell you, no, don't do this. Yeah. But the particular circumstances of this team, this brand, where there's already been decades of brand confusion, right? Like they've they've switched the uniform up as much or more than just about any team in the NHL. I'm, I'm just I looking at their damn near NBA level. I'm looking at fan art. Everything I'm up. looking at fan art of a black, red, and yellow orca. It's even better. Maybe than the current orca as well. Hey, so, I, so go with the colors. Keep the orca logo on the road. Is that what I'm hearing? And then, and then, and then skate logo, at home. Flip logos, but keep it like it's it's the color oh, scheme God, issue no. is the issue. <laughs> oh boy, guys, guys. The uh, have you seen Kevin Lankinen's mask? His throwback mask. He's got uh, oh he's God, got orcas right. on his mask with uh, with the black skate colors. Which right. is that's just, what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, that's the worst of both worlds, right? Like the, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean in terms of the mask. I, I kind of, I quite like blue and green. I, I gotta say, like guys, I, I know that this, the black skate is the hot look right now, and I agree. I think, I think that's the best look they have right now. My concern is that, you know, are you going to be like an NBA team and just follow every quick fad and just do that throughout your history? because they've actually had some semblance of consistency here for the last 30 years. Like they've actually By their standards, had the Robert. same logo. They've had the same logo. They've been blue and green for the most part, which is, you know, matches their original colors to me. Like I grew up with the black skate. So I think I'm partial to that. And I think a lot of people enjoy it, but like, is that just the, the flavor du jour yep. here? No, because for sure. 15 years ago, we weren't taught. Everyone wasn't Gaga over the, the, the black skate like a lot the thing that was like and i go back to you know the 2000s when the stick and rink made a comeback and everyone loved that everyone had the blue and green of that and that's part of why they made the switch to those the, to that color scheme because people love that love that look there was but, but no I, demand for black skate at that time 
I think they would have done better sticking with stick and rink and not the new stick and rink. L- legit old stick and rink. No, but yeah. bringing Orca in is, I think, what made people feel bleh. I, I think people mm-hmm. just didn't like the Orca logo. There, oh, wow. I, I, still there still is that because, feeling, right? Yeah. I, I hear from fans all the time that just that don't like the, the Orca. They're like, it's a corporate logo. You know, I've never really understood that argument because like, who, like Orca Bay is not a company that exists anymore. Like who cares? Well, and not their like, logo was well, different. No, and, but, and their logo was different. No, but and, and it was also yes. just like the Orca Bay was the company that they made in response to them owning the Canucks and the Grizzlies. It's not like they were already making. Right. It wasn't like they were no. making cell phones or something like that. And and it was already called Orca Bay, and you named right. it after that, right? Well, but what people who cite Orca Bay fail to realize is there's a reason why they changed, they chose that name for the company. Yes. And that is that we are the rare urban environment here on the Canadian left coast that actually has this apex predator in our waters. It pops its head up from time to time in False Creek, for heaven's sakes. So it's an indigenous animal here. People spend thousands of dollars coming to this part of the world to go out on a boat, freeze their took us off and look for these things in the wild. So <laughs> it's got indigenous connotations here with first nations people. It is absolutely uh, a on the nose, as Blake would say logo for this hockey team. Frankly, I quite like it. But what I also know is that fans love them some skate and you have so muddled your brown brand with so many looks, color schemes, logos over your 50 plus year history. Maybe it's now just time to lean into that as opposed to following the crowd and being an organization that just has one primary logo. And that's all you get night after night after night. So I have we'll some see. anecdotal evidence here about the, the, the jersey that I th- think has been the least popular jersey of the last 20 years, I think has been the, you know, with the exception of some, you know, quick one-off jerseys, has been the original Orca jersey. The Marc Messier yes. Orca, the one that Naslin, Bertuzzi, and Morrison wore, you know, for the Burgundy. West Coast Express. Yeah. yeah. That jersey, I'm going off some anecdotal evidence here, but that jersey is actually making a comeback with fans. The 90s, that kind of 90s look is is back, oh, is very in style. On opening night, I saw, guys, I saw a number 77 Anson Carter jersey in that, in, in that uh, original Orca jersey. I saw a few others. I saw a Naslin one walking around. Like, I saw a few, more than I've seen in quite some time on opening night. I kind of think that jersey's making a little bit of a comeback. And, you know, and that just sort of speaks back to like, okay, is this just a fad? Do we just like jerseys that we haven't seen in a while? I think there's an element of that. I think it's more than that, but I think that there is an element of that with the with the black skate. I think that's ironic wearing though. People would love to wear things that are so ugly that they are kind of cool. I think that's what that is. Mm-hmm. That's my guess. Uh, Rob, I apologize that we've, caused you so much angst and anxiety on this topic in this head. I I sat there and I watched your body language and I'm like, boy, he is really shook by all of this. Uh, Blake and I have taken him to a terrible place. Um, (laughs) So I'm sorry about that. I hope you'll come back next Thursday and and join us. Uh, We're we're probably done with logos and unis for at least. We had new evidence. We had to bring it up. We had to bring it up. Had to. I hope you understand. We're just, we're doing this for the people. No, I, I do this for the people as well, guys. I mean, Indeed. That's what I'm here for. We're all servants of the people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, guys.